Okay, welcome back everyone. We are now going to proceed with the grand final debate where, as you heard, the motion is this House believes that funding the Scottish Government's plan to meet 100% demand for electricity from renewable energy by 2020 is the best way to secure Scotland's future. And speaking for the motion, we have Portree, Callan Campbell, Moira McCaskill and Malin Lewis. And speaking against the motion is Charleston with Morvan Carmichael, Jemima Morris and Cameron Cochran. So without a further ado, I'd like to invite the first speaker to open the debate for the proposition from Portree. Good morning, Madam Chair, judges, ladies and gentlemen, and my fellow debaters. As the opposition, we strongly agree that funding the Scottish Government's plan to meet 100% demand for electricity from renewable energy by 2020 is the best way to secure Scotland's future. We not only believe that this is the future for Scotland's energy needs, but could have a key part to play in the future of our economy. First of all, ladies and gentlemen, let's take a look at this motion. It states that by 2020, all of our energy will be completely renewable. We can see that this statement does have its flaws, but what in the modern world doesn't? If the independence vote concludes as a yes, we will own an 80-year supply of oil. On the global market, this oil has a net worth of an astronomical £1.5 trillion. What, in, no, what educated individual would think that burning this as fuel is going to be in any way beneficial? Ah, ah, please. Uh, even if Scotland does go ahead with this target, we will still be burning this oil to sell. We're not going to throw money down the drain just, just to rely on renewable energy. Sorry, do you mean if we sell this to other countries? Yeah, we will sell it to other countries if we don't, if, even if we do go for 100% demand. Okay, I understand that. But the thing is, the North Sea oil that Scotland has is actually incredibly inefficient to use as burning. It's more likely to be used for use in cars or things like that. Um, Imagine £1.5 million put into renewable research. As you know from the previous rounds, we already lead the way in marine power. Why not expand this lead into wind or biofuels? Maybe not solar. We all know what Scotland's sun can be like. But let's glance at the other side of this argument. Um, 80 more years of oil might sound nice, but consider this. What are we going to do when it runs out? Uh, without selling it, we won't have close to as much money to invest in renewables. So when we really do need to become totally uh, reliant, our renewable energies will not be nearly as efficient and useful as they would have been with this extra funding. Besides, 100% dependency on anything is not, isn't good. But whether we like it or not, we will run out. And it's better we get used to renewables sooner rather than later. Many people are beginning to think that 2020 is too soon to reach this target. But consider we are currently around 50% dependent, and the rate our current technology is increasing, 2020 really isn't that far out of our reach at all, and could even, in our team's opinion, be, be achieved sooner. For the Scottish Government, energy and electricity is a priority. This means that while the money put towards it is limited, it's still a considerable amount, nearly £500 million, in fact. Even though only half of Scotland's budget currently goes to renewables, this is changing quickly. All the time, government receives investments for renewables, whether it be from charities... Eh, please. Uh, we can't... The, the government is spending far too much on these renewables, which we can't afford, when we have oil and um, gas, which is easily affordable. Actually, if you consider the cost of taking this oil especially out of the ground, you'll find that renewables are actually a much more economic, oh, sorry, a much, much more efficient form of energy. Um, from, yeah, sorry, receive investments from charities, companies and individuals. And each one of these increases the prospect of 100% dependency by 2020. The final point my team and I will be debating about today is to do with the Scottish jobs. Currently, Around 14,000 people are employed in the renewable sector. But as this sector continues to grow, so do the number of jobs. And while people will lose their jobs after, the, after fossil fuels stop, 
Almost all renewable manufacturers say that the skills needed for fossil fuels sector are easily transferable to renewables. So the number of people employed will actually stay roughly the same. Ladies and gentlemen, I know by now you are no doubt renewable energy is of course the right step for, uh, forward for our economy to grow. The right step away from these harmful, expensive fossil fuels and the right step towards a safer, cleaner and brighter future. Our safer, cleaner and brighter future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Portree. And I'm now going to invite the first opposition speaker to outline their case from Charleston. Madam Chair, judges, fellow debaters, ladies and gentlemen, this House believes, though without doubt, Funding the Scottish Government's plan to be 100% demand for electricity from renewables from renewable energy by 2020 is not the best way to secure Scotland's future. Fools often think they can get something for nothing. Unfortunately, a large number of our politicians agree, and this has, and with this, and have decided to try and make their fantasy come true with taxpayers' money. Easy, they tell us. All we have to do is harness infinite pow the infinite power of wind, water, wave and tide. And that will provide us all with renewable energy sources that will power Scotland into a secure future where we don't have to worry about our energy supplies and can sell our surplus to the rest of the UK. Of course, most of us are well-informed, sensible, realistic citizens who live in the real world and realise that this fantasy is far removed from the reality of the situation. No developed economy can function without a reliable and economic supply of electricity. With present UK and Scottish policies, we have been warned that within a few years there will be a risk of power failures, while increases in any prices to consumers will rise by more than 50% by 2025. The fantasy that our energy needs in the future can be supplied by renewables, mainly wind and marine, has gone on too long. This is not a question of opinion. Yes, please. Uh, you don't seem to realise that actually, at the moment, we could power Scotland seven times over from just marine energy. Right now, marine energy only powers 0.03% of um, Scotland, so I don't really think that that's possible. The facts are backed up by the laws of physics. Renewable energy sources are very low concentrations and are inter intermittent. Renewables have been, and seem to be raining, no thank you, extortionately expensive, and no amount of funding will change this fact. Marine and wind energy sources cannot be relied upon to provide energy when Scotland needs it. A recent analysis that has shown that for over 30% of the time, the output from wind farms drop below 10% of their basic output and in really cold weather can fall to virtually zero. Furthermore, it is unfortunately not correct that marine energy will provide a vast, untapped energy resource on our doorstep. Studies which have now been accepted by the government, such as this one by... Yes, please. If renewable energies aren't the way forward and our fossil fuels are going to run, run out sooner or later, what are we going to do for energy? This is about funding the Scottish Government's plan to meet 100% demand for, by 2020. We're not saying we shouldn't fund renewables. We're saying that we shouldn't, fund, we shouldn't try to get 100% by 2020 because it's just not achievable. Industry, schools, hospitals and households need a reliable and affordable source of power to ensure that Scotland runs smoothly, grows and prospers. No, oh, thank you. There is no evidence that renewables can provide this for us, so why on earth are we throwing money at these hand over fist? By all means, let us have some wind power, some solar power, some marine power, and some, in hyd no, thank you. some hydro and biomass power. But we must not pretend that these desirable but ineffective on large scale renewables can provide a secure future. Scotland needs a balanced energy supply that is both efficient and affordable. We'll be fools to put all of our precious eds in the renewables basket. The Scottish Government dangles the prospect of secure, affordable, clean green energy powering a prosperous Scotland before us. But the cost of building up green energy capacity is very high. Wave and tidal power cannot be provide energy on a large scale. There is a limited scope for further expansion of hydropower. There have been cuts and subsidies for solar power. Recently, most of the activity has been focused on onshore wind, but this costs around three times as much as conventional generations. So again, it will not provide for, for, not provide for Scotland's energy needs in the future. The Herald newspaper recently reported that one company from Hamilton, called Intelligent Land Investors, is planning 260 turbines, including 26 applications in Argyll and Butte alone. If all get the go-ahead, the company will get £30 million a year in subsidies. 
This sort of funding will not attract companies who want to provide Scotland with long-term solutions. Just more fools who think they can get something for nothing. The Scottish Government talks non-stop about renewable energy, which is expensive energy, and then claims to be concerned about fuel poverty. We have the harshest climate in the UK, and many homes are hard to heat. Around 900,000 Scots households struggle to pay their power bills. Helping them heat their homes in a way that is both economically and environmentally sustainable would be a much more sensible use of funding and should be the government's energy policy. Renewables are an attractive fantasy and we should continue to fund some projects, but funding the Scottish Government's plan to meet 100% demand for electricity by 2020 is not the, secure, the best way to secure Scotland's future. And I beg you to oppose the motion. Thank you very much, Charleston. And I'm now going to call on the second speaker to make the case for the proposition from Portree. Good afternoon, Madam Chairwoman, fellow judges, fellow debaters, ladies and gentlemen. As main speaker for our team, the proposition. I would like to go on to our team's main arguments in more detail, but firstly, I would like to refute some of the points made by the opposition. Charleston Academy have stated that we are spending too much taxpayers' money on fossil fuels, but that is not true because fossil fuels are getting the same amount of funding as renewable energies. The motion we are debating this afternoon is as follows. This House believes that funding the Scottish Government's plan to meet 100% demand for electricity, for, for electricity from renewable sources by 2020 is the best way to secure Scotland's future. Of course, this is the way forward. We are emitting far too much carbon dioxide heat in the UK. The average person in Britain causes the emission of 13,000 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent gases per year. The global average 5,800 kilograms. We are nearly triple the global average. We should be humiliated. That's why we need to start now. We need to get our act together and start to plan goals like the Scottish Government have recently set. Fossil fuels, coal, oil and gas, are only found in our earth. They have taken thousands upon thousands of years to form and we are using them up rapidly. It is expected that by 2080 we will have no more fossil fuels left. And then what will we do? Freeze in our homes because we fail to get a backup plan up and running in time? No. Yes, please. We're not saying we should just give up on renewables. We're saying we should uh, introduce them slowly so it works and is reliable. What happens if we run out of fossil fuels before we introduce renewable energies? I would now like to introduce our team's first argument. We argue that 100% reliance on renewable energy is the best way to ensure, the best way to secure Scotland's future. We have all the necessary resources, high wind speeds, miles of coastline, solar panels, and most important of all, funding. Scotland's energy budget is given 203 million pounds per year. No, thank you. And renewable energy is worth an estimated 2.8 billion pounds and the opposition team Charleston Academy want us to stop using it want us to stop using it and producing that to make way for bird torturing oil spills wildlife killing rig rigs and carbon producing expensive forms no thank you of other unattractive and unappealing sources of energy we have this opportunity to make Scotland cleaner and greener why should we waste it Yes, please. We're not wanting to waste this opportunity. We're just wanting to do it in a more sensible way rather than dashing ahead when we don't need to. If we have set plans and we sh if, the, our, if our government have already set plans for our energy, then we know that they are, they are reliable because they wouldn't back anything that is not going to work. Our second argument is that we believe that trying to reach this goal by 2020 is going to ensure we have backup energy generation in place for when our oil runs out. Because of that, our oil, whether we like it or not, is going to run out. And because of that, we need to have something ready in place, which we know is reliable. And by setting goals for 2020, we are ensuring that renewable energy are in our top priorities. 
and that we are moving forward in the right direction. The year 2020 is only five and a half years away, and in reality, that's perfect for our goals. The current Scottish Government are setting goals for the best. In five and a half years, Scotland is to become an extremely greener country. Right now, only 2.3% of all electricity we use is oil-based. This number is only going to lo lower as oil runs out, prices rise. So obviously, we are clearly going to have to look for other ways to source our energy. Our third point in the debate this afternoon is that, we're, is that if renewable energies were really as bad, then why is it getting the same amount of funding as fossil fuels? Scotland's political figures have spent many of hours debating the future of Scotland's renewable energy. It is estimated that 11,000 people are in a job because of the hundreds of renewable projects we have across our country. Renewable energy is a demanding industry and also one that pays well. A spokesperson for the government recently said, the Scottish Government is completely committed to promoting the increased use of renewable energy sources. This commitment recognises renewables' potential to, to support economic growth. The Scottish Government are telling us here that they are committed. Committed to the increased use of renewable energies, committed to support renewable energies' potential to support our ec economic growth. Scotland now has a future, and it's one that we can be sure of. We know that renewable energy is the way forward, and it is the right steps to take for a better, brighter future. The British government takes money out of our budget every year to pay for their debt. Over 33 years, Scotland has subsidised the rest of the UK by paying interest for loans we didn't take out. This enormous subsidy, which adds up to nearly £7.2 billion, and that crazy figure is growing at approximately £127 per second. By the end of my speech, our government will be forced to pay an extra £22,860 for interest on loans we didn't want. This is sourced by official government reports. This shows we can afford not to go forward with renewable energies. We don't have the money to buy other energies if fossil fuels run out and we don't have a renewable energy backup plan. Our final point in today's debate is that if we do choose not to go down the renewable route, hundreds of thousands of jobs are going to be lost. Around 11,000 jobs are going to be lost if we decide not to go for this new scheme. And that will not just affect the workers. No, it will affect 50,000 other people, families of those working in the renewable energies industries. How is that going to affect our economy? You may argue that jobs are going to be created through non-renewable through renewable energies, but what non-renewable energies? Sorry, but what happens when our oil runs out? In Scotland today, there are 109. 194,000 people without a job. And if the Scottish Government do not go forward with their plan, then not so many people are going to be needed for work. As a nation who has set a goal that includes new jobs has now, have now backed, up, backed down, this is going to drastically up our unemployment rate. Ladies and gentlemen, we know that in today's day and age, being unemployed is a very worrying and stressful time. We know that we have money from jobs and renewable energies and nobody ever crossed a river with two small jumps, only one big leap. And it's time to take our projects, our jobs and take our leap towards a bigger, better Scotland. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Portree. And I'm now going to call on the second speaker to make the case for the opposition from Charleston. Madam Chair, judges, fellow debaters, Ladies and gentlemen, as my colleague Mr Cochrane has already persuaded you, this House does not believe that funding the Scottish Government's plan to meet 100% demand for electricity from renewable energy by 2020 is the best way to secure Scotland's future. Mr Con Cochrane convinced us that renewables are an extortionately expensive fantasy. I will now focus on the details of this impossible dream. I'd like to start with wind turbines or to give them a more accurate description, wind rotors. Due to variable wind speed, their overall efficiency is only 18%. So what are the advocates of wind energy so thrilled about? Massive machines, huge costs, tiny returns. Doesn't sound so appealing, does it? And the list of failures doesn't stop there. 
because the entire structure is under so much stress, their estimated lifespan is only 20 to 25 years. They are also so mechanically complex that they are expensive to run. Yes, please. Um, you're picking holes in each individual renewable energy, but together we can easily run Scotland reliably and efficiently. None, all of these um, renewables are far too expensive, and if, if none of them are very efficient, then we clearly cannot do this in the short amount of time. No, thank you. Renewables first confirm that a 1.5 megawatt turbine costs 150,000 a year to maintain. Mr Cochrane informed us earlier that wind farms are dependent on subsidies to survive. When these handouts of taxpayers' money are withdrawn, the turbines will be left to rot. This has already happened in America, Spain and Portugal, where thousands of turbines stand silent and useless, doing nothing to support the country's energy needs. We must not continue to fund projects just because we have been sucked into the renewables fantasy. In March last year, we were all shocked to find in the media that power companies operating wind farms in Scotland were paid more than £1 million to shut down their turbines because they were generating too much electricity. Have things improved? No. In this year, the figure rose to £8.7 million. These so-called constraint payments are making a mockery of funding. How is this funding the government's plan to meet 100% electricity for renewables by 2020? It's ridiculous. What we are really doing is funding people not to generate electricity for renewables. The system is clearly not working and cannot provide a secure future for Scotland. So what other alternatives do the proposition want us to fall for? Hydro power, I hear them shouting in delight. Well, at first glance, this does seem like a safe bet. Hydro power is dependent on rainfall, so should be perfect for Scotland's climate. But as proven by the Energy Saving Trust, one five kilowatt system costs around £25,000. And then add annual maintenance to this. Scotland, yes please. We have £103 to spend on renewable energies. And if all these cost this much, and as you're suggesting, we use other ones which are even more expensive, how are we going to power the whole of Scotland by 2020? Scotland needs to be practical, and hydro power schemes are quite the opposite. 40% of their power is lost to friction and pumps, and most pumps can only supply 440 megawatts for 12 hours a day. Are the propositions suggesting that we change our lifestyles to accommodate a Scotland that is powerless for 84 hours a week? More worrying is what could happen if weather conditions affect the production of energy by hydropower. If funding plans for 100% electricity from renewables could leave us powerless, then this is not right for Scotland. And as for wave power, well, if there ever was a flight of fancy, then this is it. Despite massive funding and increasingly desperate efforts by engineers and politicians, a viable machine to harness wave power on a large scale has yet to emerge. When will the penny drop that this is mission impossible and that no amount of money will change the facts? The laws of physics and economic factors make progress almost impossible. Scotland has 9,910 kilometres of coastline. This is probably why some people believe that funding tidal power projects is a way for Scotland to secure its future energy. They are wrong. Large water-driven propellers, like the ones installed in the Sound of Isla, are, are meant to harness the power of the tides. However, although water is powerful... Yes, please. If you're, um, the opposition are saying that renewable energies are not good, but what are we going to do when our fossil fuels run out? These renewable energies have not been developed enough and we are trying to rush into them by 2020. This will just cause a, a, a huge loss for Scotland when we find that we can't power um, them because we tried to do it far too quickly. Although, no, thank you. Although water is powerful, the enormous sums of money that are required to achieve a very small amount of unreliable power is obviously not sustainable and not a secure option for Scotland yet. No, thank you. And solar power in Scotland? Well, my English teacher would confirm that this is an oxymoron. Currently, renewables cannot replace conventional power generation due to three 
indisputable point. Firstly, they are all intermittent, and in the case of wind power, unpredictable. Secondly, they all use expensive and complex machinery. And thirdly, there is no realistic technology to store large amounts of power at the moment, despite years of research and funding. Although the dream future the proposition talk of is appealing, we must remember it is just a dream. Renewable energy cannot happen unless huge quantities of subsidies are thrown at them. Money that Scotland can't afford. Renewable energy could well leave us powerless, as it has no chance of providing power on the scale we need. The proposition need to wake up and realise that the government's plan is not the best way to secure Scotland's future. And I ask you to oppose the motion. Thank you very much, Charleston. And uh, we're now moving on to the summations. So can I ask the third proposition speaker to sum up their case for Kukri, please? Good afternoon, Madam Chair, judges, fellow debaters, ladies and gentlemen. As the final speaker for our motion, I will first refute the arguments made by Charleston Academy and then conclude by funding the government's plan to meet 100% demand for electricity from renewable sources by 2020 is the best way to secure Scotland's future. In small ways, this is complicated, but on the big scale, this is simple. The fact is, fossil fuels will run out and we need to be ready as soon as possible. We need energy to survive. And if you disagree, well, maybe you're right, but I highly doubt you'll be Mr. Popular if you want humans to go back to living in mud huts. We need to take action now for our future. Charleston Academy say we cannot rely on only renewable energies. But facts clearly show that with a range of all of them, we could easily rely solely on renewables to run our country by 2020. Renewables are so diverse and we'll never have to put all our eggs in one basket. The fossil fuels won't disappear either, so we will still have money if we need it. Renewable energies are the obvious and soon to be only option for our future. We are already approximately around 50% reliable on renewably sourced energy. This percentage has increased a significant amount in recent years. There is no reason we shouldn't meet our goal, as we can only benefit from it. Continually, continuing to rely on fossil fuels means paying higher prices for our energy, and continuing to mine in places that would otherwise be conserved means constantly releasing harmful emissions into the atmosphere. Switching to renewable, renewables means safer wildlife, longer living rainforests, and more money in the pockets of you and I. Scotland's explorable new energy resources attend for 10 times its peak energy demand, and we are already a net exploration at power. 100% reliance on renewable energy is the best way to secure Scotland's future. This is because Scotland is perfectly suited for almost all the types of renewable energy. Wind turbines, and we had such high wind speeds very consistently throughout the year. Marine energy, as there are thousands of miles in coastline and hundreds of small coastal towns which lend themselves completely. Even though Scotland is not the sunniest place on earth, it does not have to be, as the solar panels use light energy, which is quite obviously around every daytime. Biomass, which needs lands, which Scotland doesn't exactly lack, and the same for geothermal. And finally, hydropower, which is almost perfect for Scotland, as it is quite literally covered in small lochs and natural fresh water supplies. And best of all, we can use whichever and as many of each of these as they are all best suited. Together, there is not an occasion that we won't be reliable. The government is putting a lot of funding into renewable energies, and therefore we know we, they wouldn't do this unless they can afford it. Charleston Academy has said that 2020 is too soon and is not necessary. By reaching this goal by 2020, we ensure that we have backup time to perfect them instead of reaching this goal the year before renewables run out and risk getting problems we can, simply cannot afford to have. And furthermore, it is not as if we will run out of renewable energies by 2020. So if the worst came to the worst, we still have fallback, which means we shouldn't set goals. We should still set goals. As for jobs, they will not decrease, and when we expand renewable energies, they can only increase. 
Currently, 2.3% of all electricity in Scotland is oil-based, and this number has continuously gone down over the past few years and will continue to do so. Charleston Academy clearly have a problem with us spending money on renewables. They fail to recognise we are investing into a successful future, which they fail to take into consideration. Charleston Academy also have a problem with us making too much energy. Our third argument is that if renewable energy is really as bad as the opposition claim, then why is it getting the same amount of funding as fossil fuels? This doesn't make sense. The government is paying £1.13 million into renewable energies, so clearly the government has more faith than the motion you, Charleston Academy, agree with. Another point which we simply cannot ignore is the aspect of jobs. Many will be created if we meet our goal, and this will greatly boost our economy and lower our unemployment. I hope that by now you can see that this is the reasonable and sensible way forward in our future to fulfil our motion. The bottom line is, why shouldn't we? We are well on the course already. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, Chair, Madam Chair, and our judges. Thank you very much, Portree. And uh, finally, I'm going to call on the third opposition speaker to sum up and close the debate from Charleston. Madam Chair, judges, fellow debaters, ladies and gentlemen, my colleague Mr Cochrane and Ms Morris have made a clear and convincing argument against the motion that funding the government's plan to meet 100% demand for electricity from renewables is the best way to secure Scotland's future. Before I go on to sum up our refutable arguments, I would like to refute some of the proposition's misguided points. The propositions say that we should lead the way in wind technology like we do in WAVE. We all may be blonde, but we know that this will get us stuck in the same situation as with wave power, not being able to move forward because we have no examples to follow. They also uh, claim that jobs will stay roughly the same as with fossil fuels. But the latest statistics show for every one job made in the renewable sector, 1.9 jobs are lost elsewhere. They also claim that proposing the motion is the way forward for Scotland. But we all know that the hare, who was too optimistic and fast, was beaten by the slow, wise and careful tortoise. They also allege that we need a backup plan for fossil, when fossil fuels run out. But what they fail to realise is that here on the opposition, we are all for renewables, but not in such a rush way, as this will not secure our future, as there are still many faults with renewables. For example, we weren't even uh, able to visit a wind farm last year because there was too much wind. The evidence that my colleague presented against funding such rush plans for renewables is impossible to deny. Wave energy is difficult to harness, as yet, despite heavy funding, a way to transport the power from the sea to the land has not been perfected. It is also the belief that harnessing wave power could slow down the rotation speed of the planet, which would be devastating for the whole world. Wind power isn't reliable. The strength of the wind is not constant and varies to zero to storm force, just like our visit to the wind farm. Scotland needs a reliable, constant supply of energy, which wind cannot provide. Solar power requires large amounts of solar panels and a large land area to place them. In Scotland, we would not have the appropriate amount of sunlight to provide the power we need. Tidal power is all well and good, but there is no effective storage system, despite massive funding. Of course, Scotland needs a reliable and affordable energy, but continuing to fund renewable projects is not the best way to secure our future. This may mean that we need to reduce the amount of energy we use, or simply build more energy facilities. It also indicates that the best solution to our energy problems is to have a balance of many different power sources. Another disadvantage of renewable energy sources is the reliability of supply. Renewable energy often relies on the weather for its source of power. When these resources are unavailable, so is the capacity to make energy from them. This can be unpredictable and inconsistent. The current cost of funding renewable energy technology is far in excess of traditional fossil fuel generation. This is because it is a new technology and as such it has an extremely large capital cost. If we leave our future energy security to the proposition, Scotland 
will be full of thousands of abandoned king monsters that used to be turbines. Turbines that proved to be useless in getting to the 2020 target. Our coastal waters will be full of useless machines that failed to harness the power of our waves and left us powerless. We will have field after field of solar panels that desperately looked for the sun that of course never came, that will have been abandoned because the technology was not be able to develop to store the power produced. The waste that renewal projects could leave us with is a shocking thought. In a few years, we will need funding to deal with e-waste. There are big plans for renewable power, but cost and lack of workable technology mean they will not work for Scotland. The difficulty with renewable energy is not whether it will be here in 500 years, it's whether it will be here next Tuesday. We cannot risk relying on renewables because they are so unreliable. This would not be beneficial to Scotland's future. A short-term reliance on a management of wind, wave, hydro, solar would be risky enough, but funding plans for 100% results by 2020 is incredibly dangerous. Scotland's weather is notoriously unreliable, so risking our energy requirements by funding renewables that work in relation to the weather is risking our future. So, ladies and gentlemen, judges, fellow debaters, it is clear that we should all oppose the motion. Thank you, Charleston, and the debate has now closed. And thank you to both Portree and Charleston for, I'm sure you'll agree, an outstanding final and a very fitting finale for the Big Green Challenge. Now, the judges have the difficult job of, uh, of, of deciding who is the winner of the Big Green Challenge, and I believe they are going to vacate the, uh, the, this, this chamber to, to the judge, judging room and uh, whilst they're making their decisions, I'm going to hand over to uh, Claire Douglas from Tricker PR, who's going to give a short presentation about the Big Green Challenge. So I think our judges will be away for about 15 to 20 minutes, but I'm, I'm sure the minute we see them, then we will stop and make an announcement on, on our winner. But bear with us until then, and I'll hand over to Claire, who's going to tell us about the Big Green Challenge. Hello everybody, um, my name is Claire Douglas, I am one of the organisers of the Big Green Challenge. I worked on this project for three years now and it's always a fantastic event to be a part of. Um, I want to talk to you just now about the importance of this project and how everybody here today is part of something that's so much bigger than just this competition. Um, 18th century French author Joseph Joubert said, it is better to debate a question without settling it than to settle a question without debating it. Renewable energy is one of the most hotly debated topics in the world right now, and learning about both sides of the argument is the only way you can truly understand the depths of an issue. In the past five years, there have been 113 debates with the Big Green Challenge. That's 226 pupils debating for, and 226 pupils debating against, motions on renewable energy. That's almost 500 pupils in total. It is hoped that renewable energy will bring up to 40,000 jobs to Scotland, and you can be a part of that. You are the generation that is going to fill these jobs, and the Big Green Challenge is an excellent platform for you to start your journey into the industry. Scottish Renewables recently undertook a survey addressing the skills gap in the renewable sector. The results showed that over a third of responding companies believed there was a gap in graduate level engineers, technician engineers and construction engineers. But it's not just the technical side of the industry where there is an identifiable gap. Almost 20% believe there is a gap in administration and management level positions, and 7% believe there is a gap in communications positions. There are even gaps in sales, planning, and policy. There are so many routes for you guys to travel. You are obviously an exceptionally bright bunch of young people who are capable of achieving anything you can put your mind to. If you have an interest in the renewable sector, then there are careers out there for you. The industry is still very young. New developments are constantly being made. The future of renewable energy is literally in your hands and you'll be the one shaping the way the world looks at energy in years to come. This brings me to the importance of the Scottish Parliament as a venue for the competition. Apart from the fact that the amount of hot air being produced in this building is probably enough to power the country for years, this is where history is made, where legislation is passed and where the future of our country is decided upon. Since opening nearly 10 years ago, the Scottish Parliament has passed many legislations to protect our environment. 
And as you all know very well, the Scottish Government's 2020 route map for renewable energy in Scotland established a target for the equivalent of 100% of Scotland's electricity demand to be supplied by renewable resources by 2020. We far succeeded the first target set, and it is clear that the industry is making progress towards the final target. And by the amount of upcoming renewable projects in the pipeline, the progress can continue well into the future as we continue to unlock Scotland's full renewables potential. In 2020, you will all be about 19, 20 years old. It seems like a very long way away, but right now is the time that you need to decide what you're going to be doing in that year. Many of you will soon be choosing your subjects for fourth, fifth or sixth year, in fact, a recent study that we undertook for past participants of the Big Green Challenge showed that nearly 100% of Big Green Challenge pupils went on to study at a higher level. Popular subjects included biology, maths and physics, and huge amounts of pupils were passionate about studying chemistry and geography. A massive 86% of past participants of the Big Green Challenge went on to or planned to study at university. In 2020, many of you will be close to graduating. Graduating at a time where it is hoped, if the targets can be achieved, that 100% of Scotland's electricity will come from renewables. You will be reading about new developments. You may even be part of their creation, helping to shape what is discussed in this very building. I just want to add right now that I'm really excited to have had Heather Reid here with us today, and I'm going to hand over to her in a minute. I have to admit, she's a bit of a childhood hero of mine. Um, there was a long time that I wanted to be a meteorologist, just like her. I remember meeting her when I was about your guys' age at Dynamic Earth. I nervously asked for her autograph and some career advice. Unfortunately, it turned out that I wasn't as great at science as I'd hoped, and my career path had to change. But it feels like I've come full circle. I'm here at an event with Heather again, in a room full of young people who are passionate about science, renewables, and the environment. And you've all done a fantastic job today. As I mentioned before, I've been involved in this project for three years now, and organising it has never been smooth sailing. From train strikes to snowdrifts, schools pulling out with a week to go, and prizes going missing in the post, it certainly always has been a big green challenge. But it's worth it all in the end to watch everybody come together with fantastic debates and to see people flourish year on year. There was a boy three years ago who was a very reluctant reserve. He had to step in at the last minute and was very nervous, barely lifted his head from his notes, you could tell he wanted to take part, but he wasn't very confident. The next year, I was surprised to see him back, but he had become an excellent speaker. He was able to convey his points very fluently. I think that this proves the Big Green Challenge has many virtues, aside from learning about renewables. And I hope that you've all benefited from it and will continue to use the skills that you have learned in your future careers and beyond. Thank you. Um, that was excellent. Uh, learned a lot there about what is a, a brilliant initiative and um, well done to everyone who has taken part in that, those debates over, over the years. Um, Claire's asked me just to say a few words about, um, about my career and about the sort of work that I, that I do now. Um, because my, my career um, involved, I suppose, quite an exciting job in the media and presenting the weather forecast on uh, television with the BBC, although I also actually worked as a, as a real forecaster for, um, for the Met Office. And that interest in, in the weather uh, started actually during my physics degree here at Edinburgh University when I did a course in atmospheric physics that uh, really sort of switched me on to the, the science of the atmosphere, which is weather. And, um, and I joined the Met Office after doing a, an MSc in, in um, satellite image processing, remote sensing, and, um, and fully intended to work in the Met Office in image processing for the rest of my life. But it didn't quite turn out that way because everyone who joined the Met Office did an introductory course on what the Met Office is all about. I did a little bit of forecasting and I really enjoyed it. And the, the Met Office college thought I was quite good at it and they thought I had some presentational skills that would then make the Met Office a lot of money if I moved into television, which I treated as a huge joke initially because I didn't think for a second I would end up on television somewhere. Um, but BBC Scotland were looking for, for someone as I, as I finished my forecaster training and, um, and I thought, well, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give it a go and, and um, I'll, I'll give it six months and see how it goes. And I ended up standing in front of the map for 15 long years saying hello there and uh, discussing the, the highs and lows, quite literally, of the, of the Scottish uh, weather. But I had also very, um, almost become um, a teacher. I had an interview at teacher training uh, college and, and was very passionate about, um, 
about education and, and physics and uh, science in particular. But what was great about being on the television was that you got invited to lots of um, events like this and um, science festivals and um, science centres. And I did a lot of work with the Institute of Physics. So I, I had a, a sort of public engagement role, got to meet Claire at, <laughs> at Dynamic Earth. And, um, and, I, and I really enjoyed combining the two jobs, you know, media forecasting the weather and uh, working in, in science engagement. And of course, during my 15 years on the television, which were 94 to 2009, I am that old, uh, climate change also really developed as a hot topic and Scotland developed as a, as a renewables uh, nation, which we have debated very thoroughly here uh, today. Um, so that was very interesting as well. And although I'm not a climatologist and I would never um, claim to have real expert knowledge in, in a lot of the issues that we've been uh, talking about, as in there are lots of academics and, um, and researchers within industry as well who are, who are very experienced in, in, in climatology and, and, uh, and global warming theories. Um, but it did really open my eyes to the uh, opportunities that climate change as a context brings in, in education. So in 2009, um, I decided that I didn't really want to be a 40-something weather girl on the television anymore. Um, weather girl was always something I would battled against as a, as, a, as a physicist and forecaster, although as you get older, the tag girl doesn't actually uh, cause as many problems as it did when I was in my 20s and very enthusiastic about being treated seriously as a scientist. Um, nonetheless, I decided that with the, uh, the onset of Curriculum for Excellence, then there was an opportunity to work more closely with education and um, also as a, as a mum to a, a, a primary one-year-old at the time, who's now finishing primary five, then my Reporting Scotland role didn't really work terribly well with them. Um, taking her to brownies and picking her up from school. So, uh, so I, I started working in, um, in education and working with organisations like um, Education Scotland, as they are now, Learning and Teaching Scotland, as they were, universities and, um, and local authorities as well. And, and the areas that, I, that, I've been, uh, that I've particularly enjoyed working in is um, interdisciplinary learning, which of course is a, is a sort of cornerstone of, of curriculum for excellence. And climate change and, and weather and renewables are brilliant examples of how interdisciplinary learning um, can really flourish because it's bringing together the science, it's bringing together today the, the, the literacy and communication skills, it's bringing um, the, the social studies and the sort of impact around geography and, um, and it's bringing a lot of numeracy and technology as well. And that reflects how, how you will work in the real world as you, as, as Claire said, go on through school and into... Um, into work or further education or higher education, then you'll find more and more that actually all these subjects you've done at school overlap more and more. And you'll be drawing on skills from all these different subjects. And to see interdisciplinary learning um, more and more in our schools, I think, is, is, is a good thing. And of course, Curriculum for Excellence has also brought us this um, context of developing global citizens, which I do think is fantastic. And you as a generation are so much aware of um, global issues compared to when, when, when I I was um, in, in school, and um, and you have this uh, this sort of social responsibility about you as well, which is just wonderful to see for for our nation. Um, so I, I'm I'm delighted to have uh, been here today and to see to see the the um, sort of interdisciplinary um, approach and the the global citizenship approach really in in action. Um, and I suppose what I am most passionate about is raising awareness about the importance of science education. Why I think you know you all the S1 to S3 really you know should um, have a have a um, excellent science education because Scotland does have an excellent tradition in the sciences. I mean, I was brought up knowing that um, that Alexander Fleming was uh, responsible for penicillin and John Logie Baird and Alexander Graham Bell. You know, all these names, these famous names that we've produced that have given the world so much. But we are continuing that tradition in Scotland today with some world-class research going on in our universities and in institutions and, um, and industry ac across the country. We lead the world in laser technology here in Scotland. We are leading the world in, uh, in, in renewables technology as well. Stratified medicine and a, and a lot of um, healthcare research as well. Plant and animal sciences. These are all areas where Scotland is leading the world today in science research. And as also Claire pointed out, there are many, many jobs available um, if, you, if you continue in science. But finally, it's not all about be, 
being a scientist for me, you know, having excellent science education at school. Yes, we need to inspire our young people to go on and become scientists and engineers, but we also need to make sure that um, our future generation is a generation of informed decision makers. Because if you think about some of the huge issues over the last decade, like GM crops, like MMR vaccinations, like, um, like climate change, then it's society that pressures um, scientists and politicians to make the right decision and come to the right conclusion. And if you haven't had a good grounding in, in science and been um, enthusiastic about science at school in terms of um, weighing up scientific data, being aware of scientific process, then you may not feel as confident as you'd like in making some of these decisions that will affect society in, in the future because science and technology will continue to underpin global society more and more, will underpin global e economies more and more. And, and therefore, your decisions in the future will become even more important. But I think, based on the evidence we've seen today, then I feel very, very confident that certainly across the Highlands and Islands here in Scotland, then we will have um, excellent and very informed decision makers and, I'm sure, plenty of um, world-class scientists coming from this part of Scotland. So thank you very much indeed for um, having me here today. Thank you. Thank you very much and, um, and I believe the judges have returned so um, I am again going to uh, hand over to Ishbel to uh, announce the overall winner and we'll present some prizes. Sure it was a difficult decision but here she is. <laughs> Thank you very much Heather and uh, I'm sure you'll join me in thanking Heather for her uh, very inspiring words. Um, uh, it's really fantastic to hear from her so thank you very much. Before I announce the winner uh, of the 2014 Big Green Challenge, uh, we would like to announce the winner of a new additional prize uh, this year, which is from Artemis. Um, and uh, I'm going to ask Neil Caldwell from Artemis Intelligent Power to come up and uh, present that award. Um, Artemis are really a fantastic success story and exactly the kind of thing that we would like to see more of right across uh, Scotland um, as we really combine engineering excellence and entrepreneurialism and uh, he has some very stirring and galvanising things to say to you and uh, I look forward to hearing from him. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction. I mean, first of all, on behalf of the judges, I just want to say how impressed we were with the standard that was on display today. Um, I really didn't expect anything like as much um, technical ability of debating, but also as much engagement in the issues. Um, so I, I started off scoring 99910, and then I had to very quickly sort of reevaluate all the scores because in, in actual fact, the standard was, was so high. Um, so I think you, you should all be very proud of that. On one of the points I drew out in the debates was to do with numbers. It's actually, I think, very difficult to make a, a, a very powerful point with numbers because everybody's dealing with different numbers on different times. Are you gigawatt hours? And I'm, I'm dealing with so many megawatts and millions and billions, and the, the, the content can, can be lost in that. But this also applies in policy. And one of the very important contributions to the debate in the UK has been made by David Mackay, who's the chief scientist of DEC, and he wrote a, a book called Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air, which is actually available free to download, so I'm not doing any product placement here. Um, and that book was very influential because it set a sort of common baseline for a lot of these comparisons. So when we're talking about how, comparing apples uh, and oranges, it's very difficult, but once you put everything onto a common baseline, then you can have a reasonable debate which is numerical and which has values. And when you get to the, the policy uh, making, these, these are very much numerical uh, evaluations which have to be made. And so I would urge you all to, to treat that as, a, as your essential reading to, to follow up from this debate and find out more about the issues around uh, sustainable energy. So uh, secondly, I, I want to talk about um, 
how we actually go forth with renewable energy and how we commercialise it in Scotland and, and, and get it working for us. And one of the, the key words here is teamwork. Um, so Artemis started uh, sort of back, back in the day as a, sort of, uh, a, a few people in, in, in a workshop making some, some bits and pieces and trying to get them working. And we had a dream, and it was a word, it was a, a name that, was, that came up, Stephen Salter, and he was my sort of inspiration. And he wrote a paper in 1985, Hydraulics for Wind, and he said, why are these gearboxes in, in turbines? Why not do it hydraulically? And he could see that if the technology was developed, that it could be a much more efficient and powerful way of, of doing it. Um, however, we had to get from there to, to, to the final point, and we had to get through there by teamwork. So we have, Artemis had to team up with other companies to get the technology from the small scale to, to the big scale. Finally, we teamed up with uh, one of the biggest companies, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, who were looking for a new technology to put in their offshore wind turbine. Uh, and it's called Sea Angel, uh, which is a very poetic name. And, uh, and sea Angel will, the first Sea Angel will be deployed off Hunterston uh, in September. And I've been a little bit uh, distracted today because I'm actually getting real-time data from the, the prototype which has been tested in Yokohama as we speak. Um, so that's very exciting for me. So once we test Sea Angel, we'll also have to te team up with the, the companies that are going to operate it. So there we're teamed up with, with SSE. So in actual fact, uh, there's a test site which SSE is, 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 is running in which Sea Angel will, 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 will be tested. And finally, of course, we'll have to team up with the companies that will de deploy these offshore turbines in the sea and operate them. Um, so that's one of the, the important uh, messages I wanted to say. Um, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries actually has its roots in Scotland. You may not know this, but a Scottish man called Thomas Glover went over to Japan at the, early, the end of the 19th century, and he helped to kickstart the Japanese industry, particularly shipbuilding. And so if you go to Nagasaki in Japan, you'll find Thomas Glover is a superstar, and, and his house is one of the biggest uh, attractions in Japan. Um, so we taught Japan actually a lot about how to industrialize and how to manufacture things and perhaps we lost it after that. So now Mitsubishi have come back and, and they're teaching us a thing or two. Mitsubishi Heavy Industries manufacture some very large equipment which they export all around the world in a high labor economy in Japan of course. Um, so this is a sign that we can do it in Scotland here. Um, one of the concepts that they're teaching us about is something called monozukuri, which is a Japanese word which means the art, science and craft of making things. And this is maybe a link to, to your schoolwork and, 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 and the, the science and maths and so on that you learn in school. So making machines and making technology is not just about the science, but there's also very important elements of craft um, to it. Machines can break because they were put together wrong or because something very small inside has, has, has been made badly. The quality has been made badly. So in order to, to, to make a, a, a work functioning machine, you actually need to get all of those elements right, the art, science, and the, and the craft. So um, when Artemis engineers look back and, into their school life, and we were all little boys and girls at one point, um, of course, we learned a lot at school about maths and, and science, um, but maybe we also learned a lot outside of school in hobbies, such as fixing things, taking things apart. Um, so one of the elements of this prize is a set of screwdrivers. I'm uh, breaking the spell now. A set of screwdrivers, which is really symbolic, and I hope it will uh, inspire uh, you to take things apart, learn how they work, and put them back together again. Um, so our technology that we've developed is actually a fusion of different elements of technology, mechanical, electrical, and software. So one of the other parts of this prize is a little kit to make your own robot. Now, I'm not telling you what to do with the robot. You can use it for good or evil. It's up to you. Um, but one thing that you'll learn is that modern technologies, particularly renewable technologies, need a fusion of mechanical, electrical, and software engineering. And so just in this little kit here, you'll learn how to build a machine, how to interface it with a sensor. It could be turning towards a light or listening for a sound and, and write some software to make it do what you want it to do. So I hope it's an inspiration for the, 
for the lucky winner. Um, and finally, I, I hope that this prize stimulates some of you to think of engineering uh, technology not as a consumer, not just to buy your, your next phone, oh, I want a flashier one, but when it breaks, try and fix it. Don't throw it away because it's broken. If you have anything around your house that's broken, try and fix it, take it apart, take that opportunity. And if you engage with technology, not as a consumer, but as a creator, you'll find it's actually much more exciting than just downloading the latest app because you're creating the next generation. You're actually creating it yourself. Um, so I hope that you'll all be inspired after this uh, to think of, of, of taking part in Scotland's future as involved in the technology and the engineering and actually building the machines that we need to, to, to gather energy, uh, uh, renewable energy. Okay, without further ado, I'm going to award the prize to the group that I thought uh, could be the engineers of tomorrow. Um, so the prize go goes to Nairn Academy. Thank you. Brilliant. Congratulations, guys. <laughs> Thank you very much, Neil, and congratulations to Nairn Academy. So now uh, I would like to announce the winner of the 2014 Big Green Challenge, and I would like to give congratulations to Charleston Academy. You have won a trip to see renewable energy in action. Um, I know that that will be a fantastic trip. I know that you know it will be fantastic because I know that, that you know there's been fantastic trips in the past, for example, Dynamic Earth and um, uh, the Eden Project. I, I, that will be arranged between you and the, the school. Um, so it will be wonderful. So if you'd like to come up and you'll be presented with your trophy and your certificate. Thank you. 
can I just, um, before you all leave, can we do the photographs at the end? Is that okay? Just, um, we will carry on uh, just before you all run away. Um, and I'd like to say well done to, to the runners at Portree High School. Uh, you have won a fantastic Kindle and an Amazon gift voucher. So, very well done. So, we will do photographs uh, in a little while, but before you all uh, rush off, I would like to thank, uh, first and foremost, the pupils who have just been absolutely wonderful and their teachers. Uh, you've clearly put in an incredible amount of time and effort uh, in preparing at each stage of the competition and we're very much appreciative of that. I think that really showed today. Um, there's been coaches right across the Highlands and Islands um, who have gone into your schools uh, to help people prepare. There have been judges throughout every stage of the competition who have given up their time on a regional basis. And of course, the judges here today, Mike McKenzie, MSP for the Highlands and Islands, Neil Caldwell from Artemis and Greg Clark from SSE Renewables. I'd like to thank them very much for giving up their time. <laughs> they were very good to work with and it was a very difficult job. Um, I would also like to pay a special tribute to our uh, sponsors, SSE Renewables and Mitsubishi Heavy, uh, Heavy Industries Europe, who've been providing mentoring and judges, um, as well as invaluable resources for this year's competition. And also, I'd like to give a very, very big thank you to Heather, who I am sure you will agree has been an absolutely wonderful host. Um, so thank you very much. I'd like to thank uh, Tricker PR, who have organised the competition on uh, behalf of HIE, from the initial communications to the schools, through to the regional heats, through to getting us here today. We do owe Mike McKenzie a very special thank you uh, for enabling us to hold the event in this uh, very, very fitting venue. And I hope you found it inspiring. It's a great building and it's wonderful to hear all of your voices in here. Uh, and last but very much not least is you, the audience, uh, for taking the time out of your days uh, to come and support the event. Uh, thank you very much. It's been a great event and I hope you're all very proud because you should be. It's just been really wonderful and inspiring, as I said from the beginning. So thank you all very much. So if I can, if we can get the photographs done, if we can do Charleston and if you would like to.